So what kind of observations and experiences influenced Darwin's idea of evolution by natural selection? Well, one of them was something called artificial selection. Darwin was, uh, he came from a wealthy family, and this family had some experience breeding racehorses, right? So he knew about breeding certain traits into the offspring. So for example, if you had two racehorses and you really liked how fast that both of them ran, and you breed them together, you could potentially get some very fast offspring from that pairing. By selecting which parents breed together, you could control the genetic makeup of the next generation, right? So by preventing certain organisms from contributing their genes to the next generation and facilitating others contributing their genes to the next generation, you could control what the gene pool of the next generation looked like. You could change it from generation to generation to generation. We do the same thing with dogs. Dogs all descended from gray wolves. But over time, we selected for different kinds of traits. So we selected for behavioral traits like companionship and loyalty and friendliness and playfulness and all that kind of stuff to make good companion dogs. We also selected for the ability to smell. We got dogs like bloodhounds. We selected for this uh, behavioral trait of catching something and then bringing it back, so you ended up with retrievers. We selected for size, so you could get St. Bernard's or Bernie's Mountain Dogs, one of my favorite kind of dogs. We selected for size again, but in the other direction, we ended up with Chihuahuas and Pomeranians and all kinds of little things like that. We selected for herding behavior, and we selected for waterproof coats, and that's how you get uh, poodles, poodle hounds, puddle hounds, right? They are really good at swimming, these poodles are. And we can control all of these traits just by deciding which parents are going to breed together. So you can change what an organism looks like. Look at all of these dogs. Now imagine that you've never seen a dog before. Would you think that these are all members of the same species? They look fundamentally different from each other. And yet, all this diversity of traits that you see came from a single parent gene pool, these gray wolves right here. All of the genes for these characteristics were kind of already in the wolves. There were some mutations that added more diversity over time, but we got all these different dog breeds from this one parent generation. We do the same thing with plants. So bananas, for instance. Banana, great snack to have, easy to peel open, no chunky seeds to deal with. That is an artificially selected crop. Uh, a natural banana actually has a very thick kind of husk, and it's got large seeds worked in. It doesn't taste all that good. You don't actually get all that much banana uh, for the effort of going into it. But over time, we have artificially selected them until we got these tiny little seeds coming out. They're basically sterile now the seeds are so small. We have to, uh, we, we need to use other mechanisms in order to clone bananas. We use grafting and that sort of thing. So they are an artificially selected crop. Carrots are an artificially selected crop. There's a wild carrot down there uh, on the right, and to the left we have kind of the modern grocery store carrot. A carrot is just a root, but over time we selected the largest and biggest and most beta-carotene rich roots uh, over and over and over again. So slowly, generation by generation, we changed what carrots looked like. We've done this with all kinds of crops. Kohlrabi, kale, uh, cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, uh, and a couple of others are all descended from the exact same wild mustard plant. We have, through agriculture, artificially selected that one plant to have all of these different traits and now be substantially different vegetables. Darwin knew that you could change the characteristics of a population by selecting which parents breed. So what he thought was maybe that's how it works in nature as well. Maybe some traits are just inherently more likely to result in a successful reproducer. So we call this natural selection, the idea that if you just have the genes which make you more likely to reproduce, you are more likely to reproduce, and therefore more of your genes will show up in the next generation. And if your genes are more common in the next generation than they were in this one, definitionally, the population has evolved. And just like those dogs uh, look very, very different from each other, over time, with little tweaks to traits, natural selection can cause organisms to look fundamentally different from each other. So here I have 
a mantis. And this particular species of mantis is very well adapted to living down in the leaf litter, blending in with uh, dead leaves in deciduous forests, right? You can see that it's got the right coloration. And take a look at that carapace. It's even got the kind of waxy, cracked appearance of a leaf. It's got that wavy outer line that makes it look like it's a leaf. It's even got little veins on it. It's got the mottled colors. It's so well adapted to looking like that leaf litter. Now, why is that? Well, uh, praying mantises are eaten by things like birds, and birds have pretty good vision. So if you have a bright green praying mantis living down on the forest floor in the leaf litter, uh, the birds are going to spot that immediately, so they will eat him. They'll eat it pretty fast. He won't live very long before it gets eaten by a bird. Meanwhile, this guy here, with these really nice camouflage adaptations, he's going to live long enough, hopefully, to reproduce. He will have more opportunities to reproduce because he will tend to live a little bit longer. And as a result, he's going to pass his genes on to the population of the next generation. The brown color gene is going to be more common in that next generation than those bright green praying mantises that we're familiar with around here. Why does it look like that though? Well, because of little changes, little mutations in the DNA, certain proteins will develop with slightly different properties to them. And as that praying mantis develops, it's going to show up with different traits. So you might have one protein that controls how shiny the carapace is, whether it looks more waxy or more like matte, more dull in color. So we got a protein that made it a little bit more shiny. Those pigments that cause that coloration, that comes from the action of several different proteins as well. So if you change how those proteins work, you can get different colors, green coloration or brown coloration or red coloration or pink coloration, whatever you like. So little adjustments happen there. And slowly but surely, you have a uh, praying mantis that's a little bit more brown. It's less likely to be picked up from the leaf litter than a praying mantis that's bright green. So this one's going to survive. And then its offspring might get a mutation that causes little lines to show up, little leaf vein kind of things. Not because it's trying to match the leaves, it can't think about this process, but if that mutation shows up, it would be an advantage. So it gets that mutation. Once that shows up, that gets kind of locked in because it helps it survive. Now one thing that's important to know about evolution is that it is the environment that determines which traits are best. If we're down in the leaf litter, then obviously brown coloration is something of an advantage. But if we're up in the leaves, then a different phenotype, a different look of the organism is going to be slightly more advantageous. Here we have another kind of mantis that has a very highly evolved form for blending in to the leaves. So if a bird flies by here, it's just going to see another leaf. It's going to go right by. This organism is going to survive and reproduce very well. If those uh, brown uh, decaying leaf, if those brown floor dwelling uh, mantises try to come up here, they'll stand out like a sore thumb. So which traits are fit depends on what environment you happen to be in. And we have my favorite mantis, the orchid mantis. This is extremely intense uh, camouflage here, but it actually serves two functions because just like the other ones, it's going to blend in with these orchids. It's going to blend in with flowers. So birds will fly right by, never eat this guy. But mantises are insect predators. And how do flowers get pollinated? Insects come up to pollinate them. So while he's looking like a flower, he can just wait there for someone to come pollinate him. And then once they come, he gets a nice free lunch. That kind of dual purpose uh, advantage really could drive natural selection pretty strongly. You've probably heard the term survival of the fittest. Now, fitness does not mean athletic fitness. It doesn't mean you have big muscles. It doesn't mean you're fast. It means that you are a good reproducer. Your evolutionary fitness is relative to your genetic contribution to the next uh, generation's gene pool. That is, the more offspring you have, the more fit you are, right? Individuals compete. How do we score? How do we keep score of that competition? Whoever has the most offspring wins. That's what we mean when we say individuals are selected. They were the best reproducers that particular generation. The individuals with highest fitness are just more likely to have more offspring. 
there's also this idea of adaptation. Generation by generation, you're going to get mutations periodically, and those mutations are going to cause new traits to emerge. If any of those traits increase that organism's fitness for any reason, they make it less likely to be attacked by predators, they make it easier for it to get food, it makes it more attractive to mates, any of those reasons that increases their fitness, then that organism, we say, has been selected, and that trait becomes what we call an adaptation. Adaptation is the process by which a species becomes better suited to the local environment over time. Now, an organism that's very, very well adapted to one environment might not be so well adapted to a different environment, right? Maybe you have a mutation which causes very thick fur to grow, very, very thick fur, and it's nice, and it's cold out here, so thick fur, that's an advantage. That is a really good adaptation, having thick fur for this arctic, chilly environment. But then let's say the climate begins to change, and things start getting quite a bit warmer. Well, suddenly, that thick fur is no longer the most advantageous trait. So if the environment changes, then the trait which makes you fit has to change also. Suddenly, those organisms with thinner fur are now the most fit organisms because they are able to maintain their body temperature a lot more easily than those ones with the thick fur. So the environment matters a lot. Darwin and Lamarck believed in this idea of descent with modification. Every generation, you know, over and over and over again, organisms are changing just a tiny little bit every time, becoming more well adapted to their environment. So here I have T-Rex, right? And generation by generation, it's becoming more chicken-like over time. Now, obviously, this is a photoshopped image, right? But it's actually based on a true scientific relationship. You see, birds are dinosaurs. Birds are the only group of dinosaurs that did not go extinct. You can divide them into the avian dinosaurs and the non-avian dinosaurs. Non-avian dinosaurs all died off, but birds remained behind. So birds are very closely related uh, to dinosaurs. And at a certain point, we found a femur, a T-Rex femur, that was very, very thick. It was a huge femur, a really good find. And it was so big that the tissue hadn't mineralized all the way through, hadn't fossilized all the way through. So there were still little bits of heme protein in the center. Not DNA. DNA doesn't last that long. Uh, but pr heme protein. And now you guys know, because you went through the DNA uh, replication, transcription, translation stuff, that if you know the order of amino acids of a protein, you can take a pretty good guess as to what the DNA looked like. So we took that heme protein from the T-Rex and we checked it against all known organisms that we had sequenced at that time, and we found out that the T-Rex was most closely related to the chicken, not like the domestic, like the wild Chinese chicken out in forests, but the T-Rex is related to a chicken. Now that does not mean that T-Rexes evolved into chickens. It's not like there was a T-Rex and then eventually we ended up with a chicken. What it means is that chickens and T-Rexes shared an ancestor more recently than a T-Rex and any other animal that we have sequenced, okay? Now that might seem surprising. Uh, that a chicken and a T-Rex are related. It turns out that if you turn certain genes on inside a chicken embryo, not adding any DNA, mind you, we're just turning certain genes on that were already there, it will grow little lizard teeth inside of its beak. Turn another gene on, it will grow a nice long lizard-like tail. So I'll put links in the doobly-doo, and I'll, I'll put this video in the playlist. There's a good TED talk uh, done by the lead researcher who is studying this kind of idea, and he talks about his quest to essentially uh, do an end run around Jurassic Park and create a dino chicken, not by using dinosaur DNA from mosquitoes, but by using modern-day birds as a kind of uh, stand-in for, uh, for dinosaur uh, DNA. How does Darwin's theory of natural selection actually work? Like, what is this big controversial idea that everyone's always talking about? What did he actually say? He made a few different observations, and each one of these observations are not something that anyone would really dispute. But if you take all of them to be true, then you've already agreed with Darwin about this idea. So here they come. All species 
tend to produce more offspring than are required to replace themselves in the population. So if humans only had enough offspring to replace themselves in the population, then every couple would have two offspring, right? Every set of humans would pair up and everyone would have two offspring, one to replace the father and one to replace the mother. But that's generally not true. And you can tell that's not true because human populations have been skyrocketing over the last 200 years. So humans are definitely having more offspring than are required to replace themselves. And that's true even though not every human successfully reproduces. Not every individual alive today will have their genes represented in the gene pool of the next generation. So organisms that breed must be on average having much higher amounts of offspring than they are, than are required to replace them. And then you take a look at things like insects, right? They can have thousands and thousands and thousands of offspring. So take a look at this uh, puffball fungus here. It's reproducing with a cloud of spores. Every little particle in this cloud can become a new fungus. So this is a massive amount of reproduction. Why is it that organisms tend to make more offspring than are actually required to replace them? because not all of those offspring are going to survive. Some of them are not going to reach the point of maturity where they have offspring of their own. So you need to make enough offspring to make sure that some of your genes get to the next generation and then some of the genes of that next generation get to the one after that. If you don't make offspring, you're a genetic dead end and you're evolutionarily irrelevant. You can think of dandelions sending out all of those seeds, right? If you blow that and all the seeds uh, go all over the place. You can think of all of the acorns that come off of a single oak tree over the course of a year, right? Organisms reproduce abundantly. We are a feckin' lot, life are. So, idea number two. Organisms vary. They have different traits, right? And that variation is heritable, that you can pass your traits on to the next generation. No one really disagree with that either. Obviously, there are different traits available in a population. You can look at a group of flowers, right? You can see that this one's red and this one's white and that one's purple and this one's blue. Lots of variety on display. You can look at a group of humans and you have no trouble identifying your friends from other people in the crowd because of the variation of their traits. Even if your friend's wearing a disguise, you can spot them because you know their traits very well. And no one would disagree with the idea that traits are heritable, that a uh, parent could pass their traits on to their offspring, right? Like, I have brown hair because my dad has brown hair. I have blue eyes because my mom had blue eyes. So they pass their traits on to me, right? And then if I were to have kids, I would pass some of my traits onto my offspring. So organisms vary, no one disagrees with that. And a lot of that variation is heritable, no one's gonna disagree with that idea either. Then he says that individuals who have traits which happen to be well-suited to the local environment are gonna have a statistically higher chance to survive and reproduce than those organisms who have traits that make them not very well adapted to that local environment, right? If you have good genes, then you're gonna have an easier go of it. That's all he's saying. Let's say you're a peacock, right? And you have very, very bright coloration, and that makes you more attractive to pea hens. A female a pea fowl is called a pea hen, for those of you that did not know. So the peacock can attract more pea hens, and as a result, he ends up having more offspring. His genes are more well represented in the next generation than someone who did not have that bright, colorful plumage, right? In some way or another, any kind of trait that increases your fitness, it's actually increasing how much you're going to reproduce. Evolution is about differential reproduction, having different traits and those traits causing you to be more or less successful at reproducing. And we can actually see evolution in process. Let's say you're a farmer and you have a crop and this crop is being eaten up by insects. Boy, I hate those insects always eating my, my flaxseed crop. I'm gonna put them right. I'm gonna wipe them out with a pesticide. It's got a new pesticide and it says on the label it kills 99.9% .9 of bugs on contact. That's a deadly poison right there. I'm gonna wipe these suckers out. So you spray it all over your field, right? You spray your field with this pesticide. But 
99.9% is not 100%. 99.9% means that one out of every 1,000 insects is going to survive afterward. And which ones are going to survive? Let's imagine that we have a trait that varies in this population. Okay, so this trait is, we'll call it poison resistance. Poison resistance. Now, most of these bugs are going to have an average resistance to poison. I mean, that's what average kind of means, right? So most of them will have an average resistance to poison. But some of them are going to be really susceptible to this poison. They're going to have a very, very hard time dealing with this poison at all. They're basically going to be allergic. So over here, we have insects that are not only vulnerable to this poison, they are allergic to this poison, okay? That's way over here. And there'll be some variation in between. So let's say we got these many bugs here, and we got this many here, and there's just a few that have that really high allergy, that really high sensitivity to it. If this much of the population is on this side of the average, we must also have some on the other side of the average. So there will be some insects that are way over here, which we'll call resistant. They're highly resistant, kind of the opposite of being allergic. Now this creates a nice bell-shaped curve in this population. Okay, so now we spray our pesticide and who is it going to kill? Well, it's definitely going to kill these guys over here, the allergic ones. They are gone. And 99.9%, it's going to kill all of the average as well. It's going to kill everyone except for the 0.1% of the insects that are there. And there's gonna be more than a thousand insects in your field. Let's say that you had a million insects in your field. If one out of every thousand is left alive after you spray your field and you had a million to start with, you have still 1,000 surviving insects at the end. And who are these insects? They're the highly resistant ones. So they have this gene for being extremely highly resistant to your pesticide, and this is the entire breeding population. You've eliminated all the rest of the competition for them, so these will be the parents of the next generation. And as a result, when that next generation is born, we're gonna have more individuals with that resistance. So the average will move over here to the right. The curve will shift as a result. It'll have moved in one direction. Now, the gene pool of this generation does not look the same as the gene pool of the previous generation. It changed from generation to generation. That is an evolutionary process.